In the year 1819, the Byzantine Empire stands tall as the most powerful nation on earth. Having been miraculously restored by the Dukes of Montferrat, it now stretches from the Persian Gulf in the east all the way to the Bay of Biscay in the west, and from Seine and Danube in the north to the scorching deserts of Sahara and Nile the life-giver in the south. The empire is united under its unwavering loyalty to the absolute power of Basilissa Irene II Paleologos, with the dynasty ruling over 500 years. Aided by her trusted counselors and the consort, Nkubu de Mura Barreto, the Prince of Congo, she observes as the empire enters a new era. Over the past century, a project started by the Basilis's great-grandmother Theodore I, Pax Piedmontana, is finally going to reach its conclusion. After a relentless campaign of re-education and indoctrination, Piemontese customs and traditions are to be widely viewed as the only acceptable ones within the Empire. Anyone can, and will, be a Piemontese citizen. Only a few last traces of foreign cultures remain in the Empire, in its largest cities. Rome, the Eternal City, and the capital of the Empire, the largest city on Earth. Smyrna, the former seat of the Ottoman Empire power. And Cairo, ancient Egyptian city. However, soon they too will embrace Piemontese fully, for the word of Basilissa is absolute and the voices of Indian philosophers that cried out for human freedoms have long been silenced by guns and drums of war. After the betrayal by the Polish Commonwealth in the Brother War just 30 years ago, the Empire found itself in a position where it lacked a reliable ally. While the Basilius gained the throne of Westphalia, a useful asset indeed, he lost a reliable ally with a large army, and thus the wheel of history turned once more. Seeking new connections, the Emperor reinforced the old ties with his cousins in Portugal, and his successors later secured alliances with the Empire of Japan, Malaya, and Congo. The newly acquired March of Wallachia was given under control of a cadet branch, and another relative was placed in Dongola, replacing the old line of emirs and firmly securing control of the area. Steady supply of money, troops and officers ensures that these marches are ready to aid the empire in times of need. At the same time, the Byzantine Empire is far from defenseless. A mighty navy secures the Mediterranean Mare Nostrum and the unrivaled army of nearly one million men. With almost two million reserves, is prepared to fight any foe on any field of any battle. Byzantium is well and truly an undisputed military hegemon. A network of colossal fortresses ensures that this time the Empire will not fall to a foreign invader. Supplying this impressive force is not cheap, but the Empire is also at the forefront of the industrial might. Far and beyond any competition, Byzantium is the richest nation on earth. 
As the Romans of old brought about roads and aqueducts, so did the Byzantines of modern age bring furnaces and factories. The largest project ever conceived to date, the Suez Canal, now connects the Red Sea and Mare Nostrum, securing Asian trade without having to use the unreliable Cape route. Riches of the world flow into Europe, ending up in the coffers of the Empire. Romans also stand at the edge of scientific knowledge and invention. With four field rotation, the gold standard and field howitzers, Rome expects the future with open arms. Matters of soul are also sought to in the Byzantine Empire. Devout Catholics, Paleologos still had a historic rivalry with the Pope, even leading to a statute in restraint of appeals, which has only been formally rescinded a few years ago. Occupation of Rome is seen by many naysayers as an offense to the Pope and the, ent and the entirety of Catholicism, with calls made to restore papacy to its holy see. But the Eternal City rightfully belongs to Byzantium, and it shall be so forevermore. Was it not us who defeated Protestantism, bringing about its end and decline? Did we not destroy the vile, godless French, who thought themselves above the holy Vicar? Did we not bring the light of God to the Middle East? North Africa and the Balkans once more? In spite of all this, the Pope remains unmoved, still undoubtedly plotting against us in his fortress residence near Riga. While it is Commonwealth who bears the mantle of Defender of the Faith, everybody knows who is the true shield of Christendom. Meanwhile, in the rest of the world, war is raging everywhere. In America, the French colonies broke free, forming nations of Canada, Illinois, Venezuela, Colombia, and Peru, who are now on a path of conquest and war with the Portuguese colonies, the native kingdoms, and each other. Meanwhile, the British Crown is invading the French colonies still under the imperial control. In Africa, Castilians are at their last stand. Shattering defeat we inflicted upon them allowed the Mali Empire to strike back. Reclaiming most of the lost territory and even expanding into the Berber coast, with only a fraction of its power left and an empire shattered into pieces. Will Spain be reborn like a golden phoenix? Central Africa is also a field of battle. Here, the Kingdom of Congo expands, subduing its native neighbors while engaged in a cold struggle against Portugal. While both nations enjoy Byzantine protection and support, They cannot openly declare war upon one another, but perhaps the Basilius can be swayed to close his all-seeing eyes at an opportune moment, perhaps in exchange for a favor of some kind. The rest of Europe 
is still embroiled in conflict, echoed since Martin Luther first nailed his parchment to the gates of his church. Protestants and Catholics of France and the remnants of the Holy Roman Empire vie for power. Tossing the Reichskron around like a bauble. Meanwhile, Prince Elector of Brandenburg, self styled King Elector, is leading their own crusade against the Swedish heretics, each time biting a larger and a larger pieces of Nordic pie. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth has nearly succeeded in replicating the mythical Lekian Empire borders, only lacking the German bit, for which it may very well compensate with the Urals and Persia. That is, of course, if the Uzbek Khan of Afghanistan lets them do so. Beyond the Central Asian steppes in the east, two Indian empires are set to fight for ultimate domination of the subcontinent. Perhaps one day a united India may pose a threat even to Byzantium itself. In China, the Emperor of Qi Dynasty is struggling to maintain legitimacy in the eyes of its population as he only controls the southern ancient capital of Canton. With Beijing in the north, under the control of a rival lord, and Nanjing still held by the heavenly kingdom of Joseon, China is doomed to a centuries-long struggle towards stability and inner peace. Far, far to the east, where the sun rises from the horizon, Japan finally spreads its wings, once also having to contend with European powers, such as Castile and France, even for control of its own territory. By this time, the shoguns finally managed to restore order across the islands. Having conquered most of Korea, all of Far East Siberia, rich in resources, and kicking out all of the European meddlers after they have been weakened, Japan secured an alliance with the most powerful nation on Earth. Now would be the perfect time to strike at the weak heart of Asia and claim the riches of China to themselves. Finally, in Southeast Asia, the Indonesian Empire of Malaya. Sitting comfortably atop of some of the Earth's richest resources, spices, and perhaps uh, some even more valuable resources to be discovered later. Almost having consolidated its home region, and often trading blows with the Chinese Emperor himself, Malaya is certainly poised to be one of the strongest nations of this world. And Australia simply exists, never truly united under a single authority. The future of this world is uncertain in all but one thing. There is war coming. The mad dream of something long gone through cruel methods imposing a vision of artificial utopia. Endless pursuit of wealth. Or simply zealous fanaticism. Cause cannot be known and is ultimately unimportant in this age of war on a scale never seen before. Millions upon millions upon millions of men, women, and children will die. <laughs>